Hello and welcome to Data Quality Nightmares, the second episode of Live with Mighty Hive. Uh, here with me today is uh, Julianne Coquet, uh, Mighty Hive Director of Analytics EMEA. I am your host, Miles Younger. And uh, once again, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. Live with Mighty Hive, in case uh, you didn't know, uh, is short information packed chats with digital media and analytics experts. You can subscribe at livewithmightyhive.splashthat.com. And if you have questions, feedback, or maybe even episode ideas, uh, we would love to hear from you at live at mightyhive.com. Quick word about Mighty Hive. Mighty Hive is a new breed of media consultancy. We work across programmatic and digital media, analytics and data strategy. Uh, we are global with offices across uh, North America, Latin America, Europe, Asia Pacific. Uh, you can see a couple of our uh, esteemed clients here on the right side of your screen. If you wanna learn more, go to mightyhive.com or email us at questions at mightyhive.com. All right. So today is spooky data quality nightmares. I'm sure we have all uh, experienced them. Uh, before we begin, two housekeeping notes. Uh, first, the uh, recording and the slides will be available for later. So rest your, your note taking hands. Uh, and lastly, there will be live Q&A at the end. Um, in Zoom, use the Q&A button uh, to ask a question. Don't do the raise hand or chat and other stuff that Zoom might, might be throwing at you. Um, so in preparing for today's episode, um, I went around and I, I did a little research into um, academic thinking about data quality. And I ran across this interesting idea called the, uh, the 110 100 rule, which is uh, with data quality, it's going to cost you, say, you know, 1x to acquire a piece of data. And if you get that data wrong, it's gonna cost you 10X later to fix it, to go back and fix it. But if you don't fix it, that data ends up costing you 100X. And so you might disagree or agree with these proportions. Who knows, maybe you even think they're bigger. I think we'd all agree that the cost of bad data gets bigger uh, uh, the longer it sits in your system. Um, but I think the interesting thing with respect to say site analytics, media measurement, audience measurement um, in digital marketing is that you often don't get that second step. You, you often cannot go back and fix bad site analytics data. You're just stuck with it forever. Uh, if you, if it doesn't get into your analytics uh, platform correctly the first time. So uh, you end up burdened with this very costly bad data uh, essentially permanently. So next thought here is the logical question would be, well, why don't you just get it right the first time? Like, why is that so hard? And so in a past life, I founded a, uh, a dynamic ad creative platform um, that mostly did uh, personalized retargeting ads. And so this involved a lot of site side data collection, a lot of tagging. And so I have a lot of experience with site side data collection, data quality issues, because it turns out with dynamic ad creative, the creative is the easy part the data quality is actually, that is the key challenge to solve. And so I actually went back um, um, just to try to answer this question of why is data quality so hard? I actually went back and like looked at old emails and old code to try to figure out, well, yes, I know it was hard, but exactly why was it so hard? And I, I made this big, big long list, you know, of, of problems that, you know, we've all had to deal with, with respect to data quality. You know, uh, if you're looking for data, did you find it where there should have been data? Was there data there? Was it, was, did it turn out to be the type of data you were expecting? Did it have like markup in it that you then had to strip out? Um, you know, do, do, you, do you have like variable typing problems where, you know, um, 50 uh, GBP is not an amount that's actually a string. And so then you have to do a string replace on the GBP to take it out. So anyway, there's like a million of these little questions that you've got to ask to ensure data quality. And, and at least in my past experience, this is one of the key reasons it ends up being so, so difficult. And Julian's going to explore even other ways that it ends up being um, problematic. So with that, 
Um, uh, I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, Julian Coquet, uh, Director of Analytics, Mighty Hive EMEA. Uh, he, had, he joined Mighty Hive in February 2020, um, and it has been great to get to know him uh, and, um, you know, learn from his expertise and, you know, honestly have somebody at the company to work with who is perhaps even more sarcastic than myself. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's got a, a long history in analytics, you know, over 20 years in analytics, consulting, and QA. He gave the opening keynote at this year's Super Week. If you want to follow him on Twitter, he is Julian Coquet uh, on Twitter. And then um, uh, on May 25th, he is doing a webinar with Google for Startups France. Now, it's in French, so if you're not a French speaker, um, um, this may not work very well for you, but uh, Julian mentioned that maybe they're going to expand this to other regions. Uh, and so I think you should see a, uh, a link to register for that in, uh, in your chat. Um, so Julian, uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, uh, you know, I want to turn things over to you so you can explain how you see yourself fitting into the analytics world. And then also you kind of brought up this, to me, obscure Dungeons and Dragons reference as to how you fit into the world. So maybe you can explain what this always rolling one for diplomacy means. Sure. Uh, thanks, Miles. A great intro. Um, uh, hello, everyone. So if you, uh, you know, haven't heard of me yet, uh, I've been in this business for far too long. So uh, basically, uh, for like 20 plus years now, I've been involved with what would become digital, so just data on the internet, right? Um, and uh, as I started as a more technical uh, person, like uh, going into the server logs and like uh, going at JavaScript and then uh, using a Java, XML, whatever, everything technical to, to do my job, I slowly went over to the business side of things, but always with having a, a technical view of, uh, of the whole picture. Um, and with expertise means that I know I get to be called for uh, more, uh, you know, delicate, more uh, topics that require expertise. So um, when I'm brought in to, to fix a problem, I'm here to not to mince words, but to bring solutions. So back to the Dungeons and Dragons reference, when you roll for initiative, like we say, is when, when you roll that die, um, and you have, you roll a one, one is like the lowest possible score. So I roll one for diplomacy because I'm not here to sugarcoat things. I'm here to get things done and fixed. So um, I have this hero complex that, you know, gets me to uh, <laughs> where I'm at today. So um, I, I do have extensive experience with consultancy around analytics, like web, mobile, so digital now, I guess. Uh, and, um, in my previous incarnation, I was also in charge of a, uh, a SaaS platform for quality assurance for Jill Analytics, which I you know, uh, helped uh, co-found and develop. So uh, I like to think I have quite a bit of, a, uh, of background in that area. And of course, I think today we're going to be talking about uh, you know, horror stories, which unfortunately are still true in 2020 uh, when they should be a thing of the past already. So... Speaking of horror stories, let's get started with those. All right. Oh so, first horror story. Bram oh, yes. Stoker's agency that copied and pasted the tracking tags. That sounds awful, yeah. Julian. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, it, it's happened recently uh, to me with quite a few clients I work with, unfortunately. Um, but the I think the, the story is... Uh, as you'll see, um, you might think it's common, but frankly, uh, it, it is these few anecdotes, these occurrences that make me think that it's very much alive and well and should be uh, hunted down by quality teams that will. Um, uh, well, let's, let's, have a, let's have a look at what happened. Walk us yeah, through. Yeah, so um, just to, to give you a bit of, of context, uh, this particular story was about a uh, premium TV channel I used to work with. And so they use this good old Adobe Analytics tracking code for their flagship website. And so they were launching a specific TV show and they had this microsite all laid out for, uh, for the promotion of that show. And um, 
apparently the agency in charge of the mini site, the micro micro site, just thought, hey, you know, they, they use that kind of tracking, which is going to be good uh, soldiers and replicate it. So they essentially took the tracking code for the homepage for the flagship website and pasted it all across the micro site. So, um, if you can see from the uh, the screen capture that Matt is showing, that essentially when the site launched, we just saw a huge traffic spike for the flagship website and nothing to be reported for the micro site. So it's not so much what we can see with say campaign tracking codes gone wrong. Here, that means I had zero visibility on the uh, micro site. No, uh, no way to track back to URLs. No, no way to track back to specific page titles. I was in a very bad place then. Yeah, if, if you look, if our, our guests look closely, the bottom line of that chart is the microsite traffic. You can miss it, but it's just the flat red line at zero. Exactly. So uh, Julian, going back to the comment I was making about the 0, 10, 100 rule and this idea that in analytics, you don't really get that chance at the, the 10x step to go back and fix what you did wrong. True. Is it possible in some cases to go back and fix stuff? Like, could they have gone in and done some work to reverse this mistake? So, so technically they could have, I mean, some analytics vendors uh, do provide the option of, I mean, for premium solutions, that is for enterprise class solutions. Um, so I mean, we're talking about the, like the GA360s, the Adobe Analytics, I and mean, the other uh, bigger solutions, uh, not going to name them all, but. Uh, in some cases, you have the option to reprocess historical data and to lessen the damage, to, to dampen the effect of the, uh, the mistake. But frankly, most of the time, it's too much work for, uh, you know, just a, uh, for something that, that should have been easily QA'd or verified prior to site launch. Again, it's not rocket science. Um, like I usually say, JavaScript and tracking in general is a 25 year old technology. We should all be trained for this. So um, if that level of hygiene is not met, you know, maybe it's a good time to uh, question your relationship with the agency that you know, did the site. <laughs> all right. So that was a very terrifying uh, analytics nightmare. Second one, the hideous and deformed e-commerce data of Dr. Frankenstein. Give us a little background on this one. Okay, first I'd like to mention that uh, we did the job right with that slide because Frankenstein is actually the scientist and not the monster. So thank you for, uh, <laughs> so for pointing that out. Um, yeah, so um, e-commerce sites are usually fun because they, uh, they sell multiple products. So when you're a mom and shop type of a, of a you know, e-commerce site, that's great. When you're an enterprise uh, company with like a gazillion product lines, product families, uh, things get ugly very quickly if your data messes up. Um, so what I thought I'd share with you, and of course I can't name names, but um, I have lost track of the, uh, the companies that tried to uh, report on product performance when they're actually out of stock. So you, you'd see like lots and lots of uh, um, you've used for our product. You have lots of lots of use for uh, products that add, added to the shopping cart. Uh, uh, you paid lots of impressions for ads upstream for people to click on the site and get to a product page or a product family where the products are out of stock. But you only uh, find that out uh, when you're on the checkout page uh, or uh, even worse, when you actually place the order and you feel, oh, wait, uh, that, uh, that product is out of stock. So uh, having a, um, a tracking strategy that allows you to include, let's say, in-store or in-stock status as part of your tracking helps you also target your ads, target your landing pages. That way you don't get to a disappointing user experience where uh, buyers or at least um, you know, prospects are looking for products they can't purchase because it's just not in stock. So um, when you work with e-commerce, generally speaking, you have to play with a very large array of attributes for your products. Mm -hmm. Are they uh, in, you know, product category, blah, 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 subcategory, sub product lines, etc. Uh, which kind of attributes they have. I mean, like recently um, working for a cosmetics company, uh, like what kind of lipstick do you use? What kind of shade? Uh, what kind of uh, 
and uh, what, what kind of packaging do they use? If it's like perfume or fragrance, uh, what size is the, the canister, the, uh, the box? So uh, all of these attributes are helpful because product managers want to know how to best market their products on the site. Mm -hmm. uh, which of these products are going to make it past the shopping cart, for instance. So um, the potential for categorization for attributes is awesome. And frankly, we could capture it all. I mean, I've seen e-commerce sites where each product literally has up to 200 attributes uh, being filled out. So that complexifies the development phase of, let's say, the tracking, but it also makes things easier uh, easier to fail. You, you're creating a lot more opportunities for your, uh, your data collection to break. Yep. And I think that's something you have to really be uh, careful about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the, in my you know, dynamic product retargeting days, uh, I was just thinking as you're describing all the product attributes and then sort of the conditional decisioning that would happen maybe based on an attribute. And that was always something mm -hmm. that uh, we had to wrestle with of like, are you are you running your retargeting pixel on out of stock you know uh, product pages because you know the, the dynamic retargeting we can see that in the product feed but are you still buying media against it you know and we don't have any mm. you know we didn't have any oh, control sure. over that because we were just the retargeting we were just the creative platform we weren't the DSP and so there had to be this coordination between us and the media buyer and to your point it starts to get very complicated very quickly so um, uh, perhaps a, a good takeaway is you know. Keep, keep things simple, among other things. All right. Sure. So. Oh, dear. The zombies. Here they all come. right. Our, our, our last nightmarish tale. Uh, this one, escaping a relentless horde of zombie MarTech tags. Explain, explain what you mean by this, Julian. Uh, no, because you, you came up with that. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but seriously, though, um, I think it's a common situation where you own a website and you have a gazillion tags installed on it because you're tracking uh, visitor behavior or audiences or uh, you know, you're tracking behavior for multiple purposes, for multiple teams even internally. And um, uh, I think yeah, the, the, uh, the illustration I had for this is the... Um, that jungle that is the all of the martech uh tools that you can uh, choose from and they, they all do uh, lots of different things i mean uh, look at the, the the content experience column alone is like the biggest um i don't know if you can see that clearly on on your screens at home barely but um but basically there's a tag for everything there's a dmp or a cdp or a uh, CMP or I don't know they, they all have these are two three others acronyms that's great uh, but all of these tools uh, are either cascading off each other which is very much the case uh, when you use like ad platforms uh, they are um, mostly JavaScript based so that means you have to have a tag on your page for that and uh, I, I, I could wager that a, a at least half of these are premium solutions. So you have to pay for those, we, meaning you have a contract with an expiration date and um, the relationship you have with each of these vendors is going to be uh, more complicated as you get more uh, dependent or attached to them. Mm -hmm. And um, what uh, I wanted to, to share was the case of uh, actually a, uh, a, a former client, let's say that uh, thought it would be fun to switch solutions. So let's say he um, picked replacement solutions for a, a bunch of those that you can see on the screens and just replaced them like, um, like from one week to the other. The, the next mm -hmm. week, all, all tools had been migrated. Except, um, even though they had rescinded their contracts, they were still part of the site's tagging. They were still sending hits. So the, uh, the vendors were essentially saying, look, you owe us that many thousand dollars because you're still collecting data uh, mm -hmm. from our platforms. Yep. And um, it's not that hard to figure out, frankly. Uh, you, you should know that once you cancel a subscription, you should have... Um, you should remove all of the tracking elements on your site to avoid paying for a service you don't use anymore. Um, so that's part of the 
uh, unfortunately, the, the, the digital cost of ownership, um, you have to make sure that whenever you install something, you pay for it, you want to uh, be able to remove it in due time so you don't you know, overuse uh, the platform. Yeah, so, so you know, this is, seems like there's data quality, but this is mm -hmm. almost this higher order level mm -hmm. of oh, yeah. meta data processing, data product quality, where you need, to, you need to manage that in addition to the data itself. Oh, completely. Uh, and, and I think it hasn't sunk into uh, with, with some teams where uh, they figure, hey, look, we're, we're the marketing team. We want that tag to do so and so. And they don't really bother uh, thinking about the implications of uh, what's happening when I'm done with the service. They don't mm -hmm. necessarily communicate with the technical team or the agency in charge of placing tags to, to use these platforms. So yeah. if you don't communicate along the company uh, tree, then things break. Yep, yep. Um, cool. So let's switch gears to some of the some of the morals of these stories. Some of the, some of the takeaways uh, uh, that we can offer our audience. So this first one, you had some thoughts on um, <clears throat> on kind of the idea of responsibility uh, within an organization. So you want to you want to walk us through that. Sure. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the illustration, the buck stops here is really uh, where we should be uh, drawing the line, who owns what. The uh, reality is that it's very rarely an IT team who owns uh, a, um, a, a MarTech tool. I mean, maybe like in the case of say New Relic or like all of the performance tracking uh, solutions, we're mostly here about MarTech. So MarTech is in marketing. So these guys should both be the persons in charge of, uh, you know, um, buying the product, signing the contract and being the liaison between, well, themselves, their, their immediate team and the IT team who's going to be, um, you know, deploying those. Because if you make enemies of the IT team, they're going to hate you forever and make your life miserable. So, um, I'm not going to go into yet another debate about IT versus marketing, but frankly, uh, these two are, they're making a lot of progress, I think, in working together, but we're not there yet. Um, so we need to have uh, someone who, whose job it is to own these relationships. Yep. Uh, it could be someone who's in purchasing, but frankly, they don't care. Uh, so I'm thinking about someone who's more of a uh, like digital manager or uh, someone who, whose job it is going to be to be responsible for owning the solutions and their, and their implementation as well yeah. as all the contract stuff that goes around with it. Yeah, so once again, this idea of data quality isn't just about the data. So we've talked about managing kind of the tech layer and this goes mm -hmm. beyond that where it, it becomes a process an organizational design and roles and responsibilities problem if you want to truly get it right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's no, um, and I think we're, we're, we're um, uh, cause we had the preparation talk here about this and uh, obviously, but um, we're, we're sort of uh, looking at a role that could be like a data quality officer or a product product owner, like a general product owner uh, mm -hmm. that would, uh, you know, play that role that would say, look, uh, yeah, you bought this product. Are you still using it? Uh, should we stop paying for it? Okay, great. So we stopped it. Are we still sending, no, uh, are we still using the service involuntarily? Mm -hmm. Do we need to ask the technical team to remove all the tracking tags, for instance? Yeah. So next idea ah, that yes. you wanted you to go. cover here has to do with automation. So, so walk us through quickly what uh, your, your thoughts on how automation can help here. So like, like I was saying uh, in my intro, I've been doing this for a while. And um, the, the primary concern I have is that if you want to do quality assurance, you can't do it uh, yourself. You're only human. So if you want to make sure that tag so-and-so is put in place correctly in that particular step of the shopping funnel, great. Sure, you have to test it out yourself, test it out manually. Um, it's almost like unit testing. And frankly, you should have unit testing for websites. And I, I think it's a, uh, it's a lost art. But uh, if you want to test out all the 
uh, the possible permutations of a shopping funnel, for instance, or uh, uh, what a user can do in terms of interaction, you're going to need automation because it's, um, you need to have the machine do the uh, heavy lifting for you because you can't. You're you're only human. Your days only have to, only have 24 hours, and uh, well, you know, carpal tunnel syndrome can be here soon enough. Yeah. So um, yeah, automation is going to be key there. So uh, so I threw around a few um, a few solution labels here that I want to to uh, to talk about. There's a few things that can help you. Uh, so in the case of like browser automation, you can look at things like Puppeteer. Or, or or even selenium. So selenium is probably uh, most known among, among you guys. Um, if you want to look at, let's say, uh, tag quality, um, look at solutions like ObservePoint, HubScan, uh, that, that's where I used to work, uh, Synaptic, DataTrue. So these solutions are here to uh, show you where your tags are broken. So uh, uh, is your Markham tag, Martech tag placed in the right place? with the right values, do the values that you have in your payload match what you expect. So these solutions take out the load, uh, or at least the, the heavy lifting out of that activity, and uh, they move you away from the sampling approach of testing to a more industrialized approach, which uh, <laughs> to, to use that iceberg analogy, because you only see the tip of the iceberg, it helps you navigate around the iceberg and not go Titanic on it. So, um, and I also mentioned that case of uh, SQL API. So if, you, if you're a nerd like me, you, you also, in some cases, want to build your own tools because they, they might be enough in some cases. Yeah. Um, if you're into uh, programmatic or uh, at least, um, you know, Google DB360, which we love here at Mighty Hive, um, you can use something called a spindle to, uh, to QA all of your labels. So it's, uh, it's very nifty. Yeah. Uh, so in closing things out here on the, uh, the takeaways, you were kind enough to sort of put a lot of these ideas into some structure here. Uh, the three stages of, of dig digital analytics <laughs> QA. You want to walk us through this real quick? Yeah, I was going to say grief, but yeah. Um, yeah, so, so really when you want to, to, to test out your, your data collection, uh, you do it in, in three, three stages. Like the top of the iceberg, okay, so what... Uh, you have in terms of collections on your sites uh, in your apps. Uh, and these are usually uh, done nowadays uh, using a tag management system. So that they use a data layer, which is your, your data dictionary that uses all the business and technical values you need to power your tags. Great. So you want to make sure the tags fire so that there's that their data is sent over to whatever Google, Adobe, I don't care. Uh, and I don't want, I want to make sure that what these tags use as a payload, so the, the information they carry is kosher. I want to make sure that uh, their information has what I expect it to do my job. If it's a product category uh, for an e-commerce site that sells fridges, I want the fridge to be under master category appliances and then mm -hmm. subcategory fridges. So all of that information needs to be uh, codified using what we call a tagging plan or a, uh, a tagging convention, however you want to call it. Uh, and so these can be audited by like the, the tools I have here on the left. So again, so Puppeteer, Selenium, HubServePoint, HubScan, Synaptic, DataTrue. So there's a bunch of those here that, uh, that make your life easier at the data collection level. Then once you're sure that your tags fire correctly, you have to make sure that at least at the Anatic solution or tag management system uh, level, the configuration is up to date and matches what the tags should be sending to your site. So are we sending data to the right property or the right, let's say data silo? Are we, do we have like all the right options turned on? Uh, do we have e-commerce enabled? Do we have uh, data upload set up to, uh, to get keywords and uh, dimensions and attributes? So all of these are super um, complex. And most of the time you can either like do things manually. So that's, uh, that's almost doable when you have like loads of sites that becomes unusable. So many times you'll have an, an API provided by say Google, uh, you know, uh, Adobe and like all of the major uh, tag providers, they'll have an API where you can do so that, sort of the configuration um, automatically or at least uh, programmatically if you have a dev handy. And then once you collect the data, you want to make sure that what you have in your report actually makes sense. Because if you if you do your best effort with like levels one and two, so you, you check your data collection, you check your configuration. If your data uh, in your report sucks, then you'll have an issue. <laughs> You're going to have a very bad time. Um, 
but yeah, seriously, it's, it is also your job to go in the report and manually check whether um, the data you collected is okay. But it makes more sense to automate using, you know, if you use BigQuery uh, for GA360, for instance, or like you use your database uh, for your Adobe stats, you want to use SQL or some sort of API, a uh, bit of Python, bit of a R or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. check whether all the values you collect in your reports, all the columns can then contain the right attributes. Uh, do the numbers fit within expected uh, ranges, you know, that sort of stuff. And cool. because people avoid that uh, that kind of a trifecta of, of checks, they end up with situations where the, their data doesn't make any sense and they make the wrong decisions based on that you know, crooked data. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, so now it is time to move on to Q and A. Julian, thanks so much for like walking us through that that structure. That was awesome. Um, so um, ask a question. Use the Q and A button in Zoom. Uh, Julian and I will will get to them live here on the uh, on the webinar. I'm going to stop my screen share uh, because on Zoom I can't see the questions until I do that. Uh, so yeah, thanks for sticking around. I know we're a little bit over time, uh, so let's. Uh, Let's do a little Q&A here. Yeah, I can uh, okay. see the questions here, Miles, so it's, it's all you. Yeah, yeah, so I see somebody asked about the recording of the webinar. Yeah, there, there, will, uh, there will definitely be one. Um, um, here's another one. Uh, you know, can you go into a little more detail on uh, how to do testing? for analytics data quality. Because yeah, Julian, you, I think you mentioned uh, a couple different things. You mentioned unit testing, which sounded interesting to me. I know there's probably products that can kind of scrape your website. You know, what's, what kind of t tactics are, are specifically available? Sure. So like I was saying, so there's, there's a, uh, the immediate uh, testing solution is you, uh, you the consultant or the, uh, the, the, the analytics expert. So you can go into your, 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 your browser and open up the pages. Um, you can like use a debugger in, uh, in Firefox and Chrome and whatever, and you can look at what sort of tags are being sent, look at the tag structure and then see what's in the payloads. But you will see there are plugins and there are uh, extensions and, uh, you know, you, you can use proxies also to look at what data is being passed and you can uh, look at that. But it's still a manual approach. So it's great when you have a small site, like a very small number of conversion points, a uh, small number of user journeys. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you have a limited, uh, let's say, uh, property, then it's easy to do it all manually. But frankly, as soon as you side changes and evolves, you have to redo that manually again. So uh, the, the tools I mentioned are, yes, they're going to be uh, scraping your website, or at least they're going to be able to, um, to follow the links or replay user journeys that you recorded to make sure that when you click that big red button, you're adding a part to a shopping cart of the right attributes. So that, uh, that really takes uh, a huge load off, which yeah. you would normally need to do manually. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we, we had a, a, another couple questions uh, come in here. Uh, next one here is, all right, we may have to paraphrase this one. How are the best practices for taxonomy implementation for a tech stack from scratch? Now, if I was to interpret that, uh, you know, uh, I work on a marketing team and this is actually something that we are constantly on the hunt for is pre-built taxonomies for stuff so that we don't have to make this ourselves. Uh, so I'd let, that's at least how I kind of interpret that question. Uh, Julian, any thoughts? Um, it's, it's not always easy to have everything set up for the entire stack because you're going to be using tools that have nothing to do with one another. But the, um, the toughest job, and, and again, uh, um, when I say I roll one for diplomacy, most of the times I don't get called to start projects. I get called when projects are you know that way uh, along and they failed and i have to come and fix everything so uh, it's easier back to your reflection on uh, like a 1 to 10 to 100x uh, miles it's easier to uh, think of everything early on in the process so um, if you want to um to Patricia's question about taxonomy uh, make sure you, you you have your data dictionary ready because you're going to be building your data layer for all of your tools with it. So you want to make sure that your site has all of these uh, terms and the values that go with them. 
uh, make sure that your developers or your CMS is ready to populate all of these values where you need them. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so here, next question is, uh, how often do you think we should refresh our data approach and QA process to ensure it is up to date and relevant to our clients? Oh, that's a great question. It's a, uh, it really is a factor of how lively your site is. Uh, let's say if you're a news or a media site, you're going to come up with like a gazillion articles per second. So mm -hmm. uh, you have to make sure that nothing breaks. But, uh, you know, the, unless you have like a major issue, like, like you, you write SQL code in your articles, um, you're not going to break things. Uh, but what is going to be the most impactful um, thing on uh, on data collection as like side revamps or like redesigns or hey look we changed the template but we forgot to add analytics or you know the the, the data layer is no longer in the template so that's when you create new site sections when you update those when you create new content when you switch from a new product database to populate your e-commerce site so all of these um, major steps these major life uh, milestones in the site's life need to be um, audited. So basically every time you have something major coming up, um, audit everything. Yep. Okay. So I think last question, uh, and, and um, let's try and answer this one kind of quickly because we're a little over time and, and uh, uh, we can wrap things up and let people get on with their days. Last question here. How best can we approach our vendor relationships so we can execute our data strategy and not become overly dependent on those relationships? Um, I, I think it boils down to that remark we had earlier about someone owning the relationship with all, all the all the tags. So someone who's the uh, the tag master. So not not going to call them the uh, the DQO or the product owner, but yeah, it is going to be something like that. And um, and you want to make sure that person is. Uh, responsible for uh, having all these uh, tools implemented properly and that they, they can also, let's say, cut the cord when, we, uh, uh, when the relationship is over and then we, we, we can sever the, uh, yeah, the cord when the, you know, the, uh, we, st we stop paying, the contract is over, we, re we retired all the tags and, and we're safe. So we mm -hmm. need someone who's in charge of that. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, yeah, let's... Um... Uh, let's start to wrap things up here. Restart my, uh, my screen share. Um, listen, um, thank you everybody for attending today. Thanks for sticking around. I know we went a little bit over time. Um, if, and thank you, Julian, for, uh, for walking us through all this. This is like hugely informational. Um, uh, if you have a question for Julian, uh, he's got his email right here, Julian at mightyhive.com, or you can stalk him on Twitter, Julian Coquet on Twitter. No spam, uh, please. <laughs> again, uh, subscribe at livewithmightyhive.splashthat.com. If you have questions uh, for Live with Mighty Hive, uh, email us at live at mightyhive.com. And last but certainly not least, um, coming up fast, in fact, on Tuesday of next week, uh, I am going to be talking with um, uh, uh, our head of digital media, uh, Rachel Adams, about the uh, ISBA programmatic transparency report that came out last week. And we're gonna be doing a dive into that. Uh, you should be seeing uh, the registration link in the chat on Zoom. So definitely invite you to register for that. Or if you're an analytics person and you don't work in media, but you wanna send it to your colleagues, do that too. Uh, so yeah, that's Tuesday, May 19th. Um, uh, hope to see you there. Uh, and uh, any parting words for the audience, Julian? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think just just be mindful of you know, what kind of data you collect. I think it's uh, just because you can collect it doesn't mean you should. Uh, because like the more data you collect, the more you're going to be uh, uh, you be worried. And uh, and to to paraphrase, uh, you know, Uncle Ben, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, but it, it is really the case here with data. Uh, I mean, you can do amazing things with data. You can do complex data with like a data science and machine learning and uh, AI and whatnot. But if your data is rotten to begin with, you're not going to get far. So ownership and, uh, and accountability are key when it comes to managing these tags. Awesome. Well, with that, 
we will conclude things once again. Thanks for coming. And uh, hopefully we will see you next week or on future episodes. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys.